discusses his latest collection, Texas Hold'em, and at 11 on Public Lives, a new biography of Mark Twain. Loretta Napoleone assesses the effectiveness of the Iraqi insurgency and the leadership of Jordanian militant Abu Musab al-Zarqawi in her new book. She spoke about it Wednesday inside the office of Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. This is 45 Minutes. Good morning. Um, we've got some extremely disturbing news in um, being reported in the Washington Post this morning. And um, the story is about the CIA holding terror suspects in secret prisons. Now, this is extremely disturbing that in our name, our government would be doing something such as this. And of course, with all of the investigations that are going on in Washington, D.C., looks like we need one more. I am extremely pleased to present today Loretta Napoleone, who um, first appeared with us in our July 22nd uh, briefing on September 11th. She was so good and so impressive that we thought we had to have her come back to Capitol Hill and present more of her work. So I am pleased to welcome Loretta to Capitol Hill and to uh, provide a briefing for all of you. Loretta Napoleone is an international scholar and author. Her, um, she has a new book, Insurgent Iraq, Al Zarqawi and the New Generation. Ms. Napoleone was a key witness in my recent congressional briefing on the 911 Commission's final report and its flawed conclusions and recommendations. I have hosted this event today to let my colleagues, the press, and the public hear her important analysis of the real nature and causes of the insurgency we are simultaneously creating and destroying in Iraq. In 2003, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell spoke before members of the United Nations to justify the forthcoming war in Iraq. Powell claimed that Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were allies and that al zarqawi was the crucial link between them. Today, we know that there was no alliance between al-Qaeda and Iraq. Colin Powell's fallacious claims created one of the most compelling myths, myths of the war on terror. As Ms. Napoleone herself notes, the terrifying myth of al zarqawi allowed the Bush administration to reinforce the false notion of America's popularity in the Muslim world, supposedly boosted by its commitment to bring freedom and democracy to Iraq. For average Americans, the, the Iraqi resistance is not represented by citizens rebelling against the yoke of occupation, but by al zarqawi an evil man, and his bunch of religious fanatics. I have been doing all I can to enlighten and inform my colleagues in Congress and the public I represent about the historical and political reality and the flawed U.S. policies that led to the attacks on September 11th and this ill-advised international war on Iraq and on terror. The 911 Commission failed to answer many of the most basic questions about the events and sponsorship of 911 and the role and responsibility of U.S. intelligence and defense agencies in the creation, support, arming, training, and use of the al-Qaeda organization that is being held responsible for the attacks on our citizens. The event today is part of that effort drawing on the expertise and analysis of one of the best scholars and writers on the topic of terrorism, its financing, 
and its historical and political roots. And with that, I will bring to you Loretta Napoleoni. And let's do that. Thank you very much, and I'll be back. Well, uh, thank you very much. I must thank Cynthia McKinney for uh, organizing this venue and John Judge for, you know, getting all of us uh, together. I, I will talk about uh, my research um, and uh, in doing that uh, I will present uh, the making uh, of the myth of al Zarqawi. Um, I must say that I was not uh, an expert on the jihadist movement when I started this research. In fact, my background is in financing of terrorism. I was approached by a French uh, documentary producer um, two years ago who asked me if I was interested in investigating the life of al Zarqawi and how he became uh, so important uh, to be today considered even you know, a bigger terrorist, international terrorist leader than Osama bin Laden. And the reason why um, this French producer, producer approached me is because in the 1990s I interviewed uh, the Italian Red Brigades and several other members of uh, right and left wing organizations which were very active in the 1970s. Um, he thought that there were similarities between the Marxist uh, terrorist groups of the 1970s uh, and al zarqawi and the jihadist movement. And I must say that I was very surprised uh, because I couldn't see the similarities. But I was intrigued by his ideas, so I began my investigation with uh, an Arab translator from Spain who had uh, contacts with the Syrian cell based in Granada. Um, members of that cell have been uh, two weeks ago charged with being part of Al-Qaeda by a court in Spain. That was the first time that uh, a European court actually found a group of um, uh, Syrian or Muslim, let's say, based in Europe, uh, um, of links with 9-11. Uh, the translator introduced me to several uh, people who were related uh, to al zarqawi or related to um, members of his organization. We conducted in interviews and our investigation primarily through internet uh, uh, emails. Uh, we did not use the primary sources uh, in this book. We wanted to protect the sources because they did not want to be revealed. Some of the f sources, of course, have been revealed because they let us, but the majority wanted to remain anonymous. So what we did, we basically used secondary sources uh, to back what the primary sources uh, had told us. Now, the picture that emerged is quite frightfully. It is, uh, to a certain extent, is almost surreal. al zarqawi is the product of, of two enemies, uh, the United States, which created the myth, uh, and al qaedism which is you know, the new anti-imperialist ideology, which was created from the ashes uh, of Al-Qaeda after 9-11. Now, let's look to explain these amazing uh, circumstances. Let's look at the life uh, of al zarqawi al zarqawi is a working class individual. He was born in the slums of Zarqa, which is a city in uh, Jordan, uh, um, which has been uh, inflated by a continuous flow of Palestinian refugees uh, since the 1960s. Uh, he does not belong to an elitist family. In that, it's very, very different from uh, the majority of the leaders uh, of the jihadist movement uh, and uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is an important characteristic, as we'll see later on, because that makes him completely different uh, from all the other leaders. Uh, he was um, is. Uh, school dropout. In fact, he didn't even finish the elementary school. He became a bully. He was arrested uh, for uh, sexual assault. Uh, he was a drunken. Um, in prison, uh, when he was a teenager, around 16, 17 years old, he was introduced to radical Salafis, but he did really not understand what was the message. Uh, what fascinated him when he was in prison was the idea to become a Mujahideen. He had this romantic idea of you know, the Arab warriors that were fighting in Afghanistan. So when he was released, uh, he decided to move to Afghanistan. But he arrived there too late to participate to any battle 
Sarajevo-Zlato. He arrived in the spring of 1989. Uh, the Soviets actually left in February 1989. So the story that we hear about him being uh, a fighter are actually false. What al Zarqawi did, without any connection or understanding of the politics of the Mujahideen, was to go and work for the Arab Afghan Bureau. And there, he was a junior clerk. Uh, basically made tea, run errands, uh, and made few photocopies. Um, but interestingly enough, um, while he was there, he met uh, Abu Zwayeda. Now, Abu Zwayeda is uh, one of the people that was um, arrested by the US uh, in uh, March 2002. And it is one of the people who is held in the secret prison run by the CIA. Apparently, Abu Zoyeda was also a junior clerk, uh, and this connection later on in life, uh, in the making of the myth, will become you know, vital, as we shall see. The most important uh, encounter was actually with somebody else. Uh, it was with al Makdrisi. al Makdrisi was a, a very well-known intellectual member of radical Salafist groups uh, Palestinian born, he actually lived for a short while before going to Kuwait in Zarqa. He was uh, very well known among the jihadist groups, and he also was um, quite close to Al Qaeda and its leadership. Uh, the two struck uh, an amazing friendship, and Al Zarqawi became the pupil of Al Makdrisi. What appealed to Al Zarqawi of the preaching of Al Makdrisi was that the the radical concept of um, the modern Salafism, which calls for a total destruction of the environment. So the Arab state has to be completely destroyed. And then from the ashes of this state, we will rebuild the new state. And this new state will be a sort of carbon copy of the old caliphate. Now, this is exactly what al Zarqawi is doing in Iraq. He's trying to destroy completely the state in order to rebuild it. The two came back to Zarqa in 1993 and uh, they set up uh, a cell, and this cell uh, um, was a sort of uh, organization, armed organization, which had the task to overthrow the Jordanian government. Um, however, they didn't do any attack, because after six months they were arrested, they were put on trial, and they were found guilty of conspiracy and charged with 15 years in prison. Now, in prison, the great transformation of al Zarqawi took place. He discovered uh, qualities that he did not yet, and these qualities were primarily leadership qualities. He was extremely compassionate with his inmates, but also he was extremely confrontational with the prison guards, becoming a sort of defensor of the rights and the interests of the inmates, so that the inmates eventually nominate him their emir, their leader. Now, this is very interesting because, you know, he was in prison with al Makdrisi, who was an intellectual, was a well-known, internationally well-known jihadist, and yet the people choose al Zarqawi. Uh, clearly, this man had something that other people don't, and this is this leadership qualities. And this is something that later on in life also will be very important. In 1999, the, uh, for the coronation of King Abdullah, um, members of um, various uh, uh, organizations linked to the jihadist movement, but also common criminals, were freed through an, inter an amnesty. Uh, al Zarqawi was among these people, and so was al Makdrisi. Al Zarqawi decided to go back to Pakistan, and then from Pakistan, he wanted to reach Chechnya. The reason why he wanted to go to Chechnya is because he was fascinating with Katab. Um, Qatab at that time was leading the jihadist uh, insurgency against the Russian. Um, it's very important uh, to understand why he was so fascinating with Qatab. At that time, uh, and we're talking about uh, the end of the 1990s, uh, there was a big dispute uh, within the jihadist international network. And this dispute was about the nature of the jihad. 
In 1998, Osama bin Laden had launched a campaign against the new crusaders. Uh, in particular, we're talking about the Americans and you know, the Jews, so the Christian and the Jews. Um, this was uh, a vision related to fighting against the faraway enemy. The faraway enemy was the United States, who was perceived as the power that was maintaining the corrupted oligarchic elites, which were ruling the Muslim world in a position to continue their ruling. Um, not everybody agreed with this view. Qatab was one of those people. Qatab instead wanted to focus on the near enemy, maintain the jihad localized in one single country. So fight the corrupted elite, um, elite who are ruling these countries. And then later on, once you know, this elite have been destroyed, concentrate on the faraway enemy. Now, al Zarqawi was very much a supporter of this view. His horizon was very limited. He actually wanted to continue to fight in Jordan, but of course he couldn't. So he thought by going to join Qatab, he could start uh, all over again to get closer and closer to Jordan. And this is what he's doing today in Iraq. The reason why he's in Iraq is because it is a, a step farther to go back to Jordan. He does not have a global vision of the jihad as Osama bin Laden. So he got to Pakistan um, at the end of uh, 1999, but he never reached Chechnya. He was arrested for an expiry visa, and he was given two choices. Either he was going to go back to Jordan, which he did not want to do, or he was going to cross over Afghanistan. So he crossed over Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, he became a leader of a very sg small group of Palestinian and Jordanians who were there searching for you know, a new role in the new Taliban regime. And at that time, at the beginning of 2000, finally al Zarqawi met Osama bin Laden. It was a very interesting meeting. Osama bin Laden was the leader of uh, Al-Qaeda, a very, very powerful man uh, in Afghanistan. al Zarqawi was a nobody. He was the leader of this small group uh, of individuals who did not even have a name, they did not have a base. And the reason why al Zarqawi met Osama bin Laden is because he was looking for a sponsor. He basically was looking for money. He wanted to set up uh, a little camp uh, where he could look after his followers. Um, Osama bin Laden uh, offered al Zarqawi to become part of Al-Qaeda. He offered it to him, but also to his group. Now, this is uh, very interesting uh, because uh, al Zarqawi was not an important individual. However, at that time, Osama bin Laden was having serious troubles uh, within Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime. So he was seeking support everywhere he could get it. There was inside Al-Qaeda a big debate and a major split. Um, a group uh, which we could define the moderates were very much against Osama bin Laden's idea to attack America. They were afraid that America would retaliate if attacked. Um, these people were also supported by the majority of the Taliban leadership, but also by the Pakistani backers of the Taliban, and in particular by the ISI, the Pakistani Secret Service. Then there was another group which we could define the hardliner. These people actually were also opposing Osama bin Laden policy to attack America. They were afraid of retaliation. So what they wanted to do, they wanted to acquire weapons of mass destruction to place in America before 9-11 and use them in case America would invade. Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden never believed in weapons of mass destruction. He thought that America would not withstand the third blow. The first one was, of course, the attack against uh, the um, African embassies. The second one was the attack against the USS Cole, and the third one was 9-11. He really believed that America would collapse uh, psychologically after 9-11. So he never went ahead uh, to seek uh, weapons of mass destruction. So this was the situation uh, in the uh, beginning of 2000 uh, inside Al-Qaeda and in Afghanistan. There was very serious infighting. al Zarqawi rejected Osama bin Laden offer, 
which is very interesting also, rejected the offer because he could not accept the fight against the faraway enemy. He just could not understand why fighting against America when you know, there were so many other countries where they should have fought first, and in particular Jordan. So he was still very much supporting the near enemy. Now, it's, uh, many people said, how is it possible that an individual who is nobody with no money actually refused such an offer? And I interview many people who have met uh, al-Zarqawi, including uh, members of his group, and they all confirm that this is very much in line with the personality of the individual. He never follows anybody. He never prays anybody else apart from the prophet. It is one of these individuals which is very strong-minded and is not afraid of saying no to authority. But what happened after the meeting was that um, Al-Zarqawi was able to exploit the infighting inside Al-Qaeda to his own advantage. He convinced the Taliban to fund a very small camp in Herat, which is near the border between Afghanistan and Iran. Uh, the camp was tiny, it was really run on a shoestring, people that uh, traveled to the camp had to fund themselves, uh, um, so there was absolutely no financial support uh, for you know, future members of the camp. Um, the majority of the people in the camp came from Syria, from uh, Palestine, and from Jordan. It was completely separated but from the other camps run by Al-Qaeda. The purpose of the camp was uh, to forge future suicide bombers. The idea was to use suicide bombers for suicide missions back in the country of origins. And again, we're talking about Palestine, we're talking about Jordan, and we're talking about Syria. Um, because he was in Iraq, uh, um, he managed, Al-Zarqawi managed to establish certain links with Sunni radical Salafis across the border in Iran. But also, he maintained a, a relationship with a group of Jordanians <coughs> who he had met in prison uh, in the 1990s. People from the city of Salt who had crossed over to Iraq and had settled in northern Iraq, what is commonly known as Iraqi Kurdistan. These people had set a small jihadist strongholds in the region and eventually in 2000 had merged with Ansar al-Islam, which was a group of um, radical Salafis uh, inspired by al-Qaeda. Now it was thanks to these connections that after 9-11, after the Battle of Tora Bora, Al-Zarqawi and his group were able to cross over to Iran and eventually to reach Iraq. This is also another proof that Al-Zarqawi was not part of Al-Qaeda, because the Al-Qaeda leadership actually escaped in the opposite direction. They went to Pakistan, and they're still in hiding in the tribal belt between Afghanistan and Pakistan. He actually went the opposite direction. Um, part of this uh, group, uh, people that had uh, passports uh, or legal travel documents uh, were able to cross over to Turkey and then from there they went back to the Middle East, to the country of origins. But the majority of the people, people like him, who did not have passport or travel documents uh, actually went to Iraqi Kurdistan. Now that move is very much the beginning of the making of his myth because the Americans were informed of the existence of al-Zarqawi at the end of 2001 by the Kurdish Secret Service. The Kurdish Secret Service alerted the Americans that al-Zarqawi was the link between Ansar al-Islam and al-Qaeda and the link between al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. The Americans did not even know who he was. So what they did, they went to the Jordanians uh, and asked the Jordanians who was al-Zarqawi. And the Jordanians thought there was a great opportunity to frame an individual for a series of attacks, terrorist attack and assassination that they could not solve. So all of a sudden, at the beginning of 2000, al-Zarqawi becomes the main 
mastermind uh, individual of a series of assassination of attacks, and that includes uh, the killing of Lawrence Foley, the U.S. diplomat in Jordan. Interestingly enough, uh, the majority of the accusations are based upon confessions of individuals, former members of Al-Qaeda, which were kept and still are in the secret CIA prisons, uh, which we have recently discovered the U.S. is running. One of them is uh, Abu Zoyeda. Abu Zoyeda was arrested in March 2002. He was considered the guy who actually masterminded from Afghanistan the Millennium Plot, which was foiled by the Jordanians. That was a plot whereby a series of important locations in Jordan were going to be attacked for you know, the Millennium celebrations. The link with al zarqawi was Abu Zwayeda. The Americans claimed and the Jordanians who went along with that, the Abu Zoyeda had kept in touch with al zarqawi through the years, so we're, so we're talking from the early 1990s until 2000, and that al zarqawi was the man who was masterminding the Millennium Plot. No proofs has been produced apart from these confessions. A lot of people in Jordan at that point believed the al zarqawi had been framed for a specific reason, but they could not understand which reason. The reason uh, became apparent on the 5th of February 2003 when Colin Power went to the Security Council and in front of the world he actually presented al zarqawi as the link between Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. Nobody had heard of al zarqawi before that day. I mean, everybody in the community of terrorist experts had never heard his name. Interestingly enough, from that moment onwards, al zarqawi became the man who masterminded the majority of the terrorist attack which had taken place after 9-11. Of course, uh, everybody wanted, in the jihadist world also, everybody wanted to be part of uh, his network. Uh, suddenly, he was presented as the new jihadist Zorro, who has managed to outsmart the coalition forces in Iraq, but also you know, the Western anti-terrorist fight. Um, so it's almost, uh, I think, you know, paradoxical that all of a sudden the making of his myth becomes beneficial to the two enemies, to the United States, the Kurds and the Jordanians. The Kurds managed to convince the Americans to intervene to help them to get rid of the jihadists in northern Kurdistan. The Jordanians were able to find um, um, the men who masterminding this mysterious killing and attacks, and the Americans found a reason to justify the war in Iraq, in Iraq by linking um, al zarqawi to Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. But at the same time, the myth of al zarqawi was extremely beneficial for the jihadist movement. After 9-11, after the Battle of Tora Bora, Al-Qaeda had been completely destroyed, and the jihadist movement was lost. I mean, its leader was in hiding. There was not a new momentum. Um, there was a moment in which, really, Al-Qaeda could have been completely wiped away, and we could have won the war on terror. The war in Iraq and the making of the myth of al zarqawi relaunched the idea of bin Laden on, of the faraway enemy. He relaunched Al-Qaeda, which was no longer a small arm organization, a transnational armed organization, but became a, a new creed, an ideology, the new anti-imperialist ideology. And al zarqawi is the new icon of this anti-imperialist ideology. And we're seeing this confirmed by the reason why People, young people, have actually committed crime in uh, in Madrid, in the Madrid bombing, but also in the London bombing. In the video um, of one of the London bombing uh, um, participants, uh, what 
the guy is saying is actually saying, you know, we are part of an army. We are, part, we are soldiers and we are fighting a war against you because you have invaded Iraq. So the link between Iraq, the war in Iraq, and this new anti-imperialist ideology is extremely strong. So uh, this is basically the story of the making of the meat. Now, wh what are the similarities uh, with the Marxist, uh, the 1970s ma Marxist group? Well, for a start, um, all we can say is that the, mar the, the movements uh, of the 1970s, uh, were the Marxist movement of the 1970s, were also part of an anti-imperialist ideology. People join in because they thought that they were fighting, you know, an ideological war. This ideological war also had been created by the war by proxy, which had been fought by the United States and the Soviet after World War II. So that socialism in one country, which was the concept of the Soviet Revolution, became a sort of international ideology. And, and the same thing is happening today. What we have done, we actually have created a new ideology. And we are given this ideology a new icon by creating an individual who actually does not exist, who eventually has become what we wanted him to be. Another interesting element is the, the origins of um, al-Zarqawi. Many people believe uh, in the jihadist movement that because he comes from a working class background, uh, that's a sign of democratization within the jihadist movement. Uh, I mean, they're proud that one of them, uh, underprivileged, uh, unintellectual, uneducated, a simple individual actually got to the very top of the jihadist pyramid and is as famous as Osama bin Laden, the super privileged individual. Well, the truth is that there is no democratization whatsoever in the, the jihadist movement. Al-Zarqawi got to the, po the top because we, the West, actually created this myth. We put him there. The jihadist movement did not put al-Zarqawi there. The jihadist movement is today as elitist as it was in the past. And as it was the Marxist movement, uh, an elitist movement. Let's not forget that Che Guevara was a doctor, as is al-Zwahiri. And Fidel Castro grew up in a very privileged household, as did Osama bin Laden. So to conclude, uh, what can we do? I mean, how can we get out of this stalemate that we actually have created? Well, the first step would be to deconstruct the myth. And in order to deconstruct the myth, we should start saying the truth about what is happening in Iraq. Al-Zarqawi is not in control of the resistance. It's one of a very small group of people who are actually fighting uh, a war which is, you know, a war for the new jihadist victory. I mean, the resistance is composed by many, many other groups. We're talking about the Shia, the Sunni, we're talking about the Kurds, and then we have, you know, the militia, and then we have the terror squads, and then we have, you know, the terror gangs. I mean, we're talking about a very diversified environment where al-Zarqawi is just one little element. So by starting to say the truth, by starting to deconstruct the meat, we can actually present to the jihadist world what the truth really is, that al-Zarqawi is not so important, that the jihadist movement is very, very small, that the majority of the Muslims are actually moderates, and they do not want to be part of this reality. And by backing the moderates, we can start really constructing democracy. If democracy is what we really want, which I hope it is. Thank you. Um, do, you do you have an opinion on the, the, um, the authenticity of the video um, that Sarkari was supposedly on where they were beheading Nick Berg? Um, I don't know much specifically about it, but I know that some people pointed to the inconsistencies that, um, that he was wearing his wedding ring on the wrong finger, that the, the, it's very heavily edited, and the time stamp, you know, kind of jumps back and forth. And, and uh, I think the, the, the people pointed to inconsistencies. I, do you have any sort of insight on that? He, he did behead Nicholas Berg. 
that's my information. That it would now, if the video was authentic, uh, of course, you know, we can't say. But the people I interviewed, they all said that yes, it was him. Some people were very surprised that it was him, and I tell you why, because apparently, when before he went to jail, he. Um, it was quite thin, uh, and it was even physically, it, w it was not a distinguished individual. In jail, uh, he started to build up his body. He was completely obsessed uh, with exercising. Um, so he just fill up. And so the image, many people that met him in Afghanistan, they said he can't be him because, you know, he's just too muscly. I mean, his physique is completely different, but apparently he could rebuild his physique at that time. About the wedding, uh, I, I really think that that's not, uh, I mean, you can't judge it. He may have changed the wedding or the ring or whatever. I don't think that we can base the fact that the video is authentic or not on that uh, element. Uh, but I think uh, that it was him for another reason, because he was part of his strategy. See, w what happened was that while his myth was growing exponentially in the West, uh, inside Iraq he was actually very weak. He could not rally around himself, uh, the Sunni population, because he's not a religious authority. He is a foreigner. He had no money whatsoever. He did not have the authority to become a sort of leader, an icon. So what he tried to do, he tried to convince bin Laden to back him. And there is, from the beginning of summer 2003, when he started his activity, when he entered basically the war, until November 2004, when he became member of Al-Qaeda, when he became the emir of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, there is this constant correspondence between uh, al-Zarqawi and Osama bin Laden and al-Zawahiri, whereby he's trying to convince them of his strategy. And part of his strategy, it is actually the beheading of Western hostages. The cost of this deconstruction that you're talking about of this mythology also mean, though, that we'd have to look at the insurgency in Iraq in a different way. Yes, I think, well, that's the key question, really. Are we ready to do that? Um, the insurgency clearly is not uh, structure as we have been told until today. Um, it's not al-Zarqawi and the so-called terrorists who are leading the insurgency, but it's actually the common people who are joining the insurgencies because they are unhappy about what is happening in Iraq. And, and then, on top of that, we have uh, the militias. Uh, b because the situation on the ground uh, is so insecure and so dangerous uh, that militias have been created in order to protect certain neighbors. Uh, even families, uh, clans, uh, tribes have organized their, their own militia. So this is really the reality on, on the ground. Um, but it will take, uh, I think, a certain kind of maturity, but also humility for Western powers to admit that this is actually the reality on the ground. Uh, and we're not fighting a sort of war between good and evil, but we're actually fighting a situation whereby you have a sort of balkanization of Iraq, where you have proliferation of various groups where all, which are fighting with each other. Can you say something, maybe you did it before, but can you say something about Zarqawi um, al-Qaeda? Is that politics or is that religion? Uh, what do you mean, the link between... Uh, no, no, I mean, all together, the whole group, if there is a group. Do we talk about differences about religion, or is that is that a matter of politics? In well, three, yeah. think of it? I don't think religion, I mean, in, in my previous book, I actually argue very strongly that the re religion is a sort of ideological umbrella <clears throat> under which we have real serious political and economic alliances. Now, in the case of Al-Qaeda, for sure, the backers of Al-Qaeda, the financial backers of Al-Qaeda, we know where they're coming from. It's coming from the Gulf. We're talking about the middle class, the commercial middle class bankers, traders who 
want to change the political situation inside their country because they are blocked in their economic growth by the interests of the existing oligarchic elites who of course are also pursuing the interests of Western corporations. So these are the real backers. These backers today are also backing al-Zarqawi. And w one of the reasons why they're backing al-Zarqawi is not only because he is perceived as the new uh, superhero of you know, the jihadists in Iraq, but also because Osama bin Laden in November 2004 encouraged in a um, declaration he issue, encouraged his uh, sponsors to uh, move the money, the funds uh, from Al-Qaeda to um, Al-Zarqawi. Now, if you ask me if Al-Zarqawi has a political agenda, I will tell you that according to my investigation, no, he doesn't. It's very different from Osama bin Laden because he's a simple man, because he does not have the kind of breath that comes with being educated and, ra and raised in a family, which is a privileged family. Uh, now, he clearly has a group of people who have joined him after the war in Iraq started, who are doing the political analysis. If you read the letters he sent to Osama bin Laden, they're clearly not written by him. They're clearly written by somebody who has an understanding of the politics of you know, the situation in Iraq. Um, he has um, natural organizational skills, which clearly come very handy. It, in a guerrilla kind of environment. But I really do not think that he has a political agenda. I, do, I really do not think that he really knows what he will do if and when he wins. He has this romantic idea of recreating the caliphate, but I don't think that he actually has any idea of how to structure a new society. How did you do your research for the book? Were there, were there, did you travel to the, in, in the Middle East extensively, and were there times where you ever felt that you were in danger? Well, I was. Um, I did uh, most of my interviews. That they were actually done through um, the internet because some of these people are unreachable. I, I did travel to some countries. Uh, but not to the Middle East, funny enough. I actually traveled in Europe. Uh, one of the um, most difficult part of my research was to prove that Al-Zarqawi is not in charge of a European network. Because <laughs> that was really what um, the US and the European countries have been saying uh, since you know, 2002. They actually was the guy who masterminded the uh, Madrid bombing, uh, also the London bombing, by the way, but also the Istanbul bombing in, in, in 2002. So uh, I actually wanted to prove that this was not true. Um, I always went with this uh, translator who um, to a certain extent I think you know, probably did protect me but also gave me the opportunity to talk to people that would never talk to me because of course they did not trust me. Um, but no, I don't think that I was in danger. Funnily enough, uh, I think that there is within uh, the jihadist uh, sort of network uh, in Europe, uh, there is the willingness to talk to people in order to explain what they're doing. You must understand that as was for the Red Brigades and other groups uh, that I interviewed in the past, these people do not consider themselves uh, criminals, they do not consider themselves uh, terrorists, they consider themselves soldiers. So. If you give them an opportunity to explain uh, why they are soldiers, they're, they're actually very happy. Um, so no, I don't. I was not afraid of that. When the letter that was supposed to be between correspondence between Zarqawi and Zawahiri came out recently, um, Professor John Cole um, mm. raised some points about the, the particulars of the religious forms of greeting in that letter. Um, and, and found it very unusual. That, do you have any perspective on that? Yes, I, I, I read what Professor Cobb put on the web, actually. Um, I, I think he's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the form of uh, greetings, it, it would never be one of a Sunni. It, it's really reminiscent of the way 
uh, Shia Greek themselves, uh, not so much in uh, a letter form, but as in meeting. Um, I think I, I think what has happened is possible, actually, is that that letter was uh, produced by Shia militia or somebody close uh, to one of the groups uh, in, uh, of the Shia in, in Iraq, possibly even by a Kurdish group. Uh, and then it was planted somewhere where, of course, the US Army found it. Um, my objection to the authenticity of the letter is based upon uh, uh, other elements. Uh, um, now, the creation of suicide mission as the most important tool in the jihadist uh, uh, struggle against uh, the West uh, is actually a creation of uh, Al Zawahiri. In the 1990s, Al Zawahiri basically uh, forged uh, Al Qaeda from what he was, uh, which was you know, a sort of vanguard of the Mujahideen, a ragged vanguard of the Mujahideen that was going to go and help Muslim oppress anywhere in the world into a terrorist organization. And this terrorist organization was based upon uh, a new strategy, and this strategy was to use suicide missions. Uh, there is extensive literature written by al Zawahiri in the 1990s, uh, which was praised by al Makdrisi, funnily enough, and possibly al Makdrisi introduced al Zarqawi to this kind of literature, whereby he also discussed at length uh, um, why it is right for the jihad to be carried on through suicide missions whereby innocent Muslim will be killed in these missions. And he justifies that on the basis that the jihad has to carry on, but also he gives the, the victims, the innocent Muslim victims, the status of martyrs whereby you know, they have all the advantages uh, after you know, life that the martyrs, the, act the actual suicide bombers you know, will get. Um, and it's interesting that this was uh, al Zawahiri policy all the way through. So how is it possible that today al Zawahiri refers to al Zarqawi saying stop the suicide missions because <laughs> they are decreasing our popularity within the Muslim world when it is his own creation and where he actually has discussed at length why this mission will continue to be beneficial to the jihad and to the Muslim world. This is a major, major contradiction. Knowing al Zawahiri for what he is, uh, he would never admit to have made a mistake. And in that letter, he's actually admitting to have made a mistake. Then there is the tone of the letter. I mean, he's treating al Zarqawi as a sort of uh, super leader. It's uh, almost deferent towards him, which is also doesn't make any sense at all because you know, al Zarqawi is not one of the intellectual and ideological leaders of Al-Qaeda. Um, and then uh, um, there is another element uh, which is interesting. He's, ask, he's actually asking uh, al Zarqawi for money. He's saying, could you spare 100,000, uh, not specifying which currency, and send them to us? Now, how is it possible that uh, al Zawahiri is asking money to al Zarqawi when Osama bin Laden in November 2004, he actually advised his sponsors uh, to send money to al Zarqawi. That shows that, al, that Osama bin Laden is still very much in control of the flow of the money from his sponsors. Uh, so I think you know, these are my strongest objections to, to the letter.